Welcome to the Public Interest Technology PIT Colloquium. My name is Rob Abbas and I'm a visiting professor at Arizona State University's School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Together with the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective, Katina Michael, we are delighted to be launching Series 3 of this unique seminar series. The Public Interest Technology Colloquium is an opportunity to hear from our global community about the social, regulatory, ethical and other considerations relevant to the design, development and delivery of technology in the public interest. The colloquium is underpinned by the PIT philosophy that is intended to draw people together from across disciplines to address global challenges. Public interest technology at its core requires shared meaning which is translational. It is to be inclusive rather than exclusive. It is transdisciplinary while also respecting the disciplines. Throughout the series, we'll be hearing from a range of speakers who will be sharing with us their experiences and expertise. Our guest today is Professor Kathy Treadaway. Kathy Treadaway is a Professor of Creative Practice at Cardiff Metropolitan University in the UK, and is also the Research Director of HUG by Laugh. Over the last 10 years, her academic research has focused on design for dementia care, where she was the principal investigator of the research projects LAF between 2015 and 2018 and LAF Empowered between 2018 and 2021. These projects, which have resulted in a range of designs for innovative products for people living with dementia, include the award-winning HUG, which is an interactive sensory product designed to be cuddled and contains a simulated beating heart and a music player. HUG is now being used by care home residents and patients in hospitals in the UK, where it has been made available on prescription. HUG by Love, in partnership with Alzheimer's Society UK, is ensuring that HUG is now commercially available and can benefit people living with dementia and cognitive impairment. When considering public interest technology and methodologies for design, we often emphasise the importance of human-centred and values-based approaches. Professor Treadaway's HUG is an example that follows a values-based approach, using compassion as the centrepiece. In today's session, Professor Treadaway will be talking to us on the topic of compassion, and more specifically, compassionate design. Compassionate design, which was developed by Professor Treadaway in 2016, is a methodology to guide the design of products for people living with advanced dementia. It is now being taught in universities and design schools around the world. And with that, we will now hand over to Professor Kathy Treadaway for a session on compassionate design, keeping loving kindness at the heart. Thank you, Professor Treadaway, for joining us. Good evening. Well, it's not good evening for you, is it? It's good morning, but it's lovely to be with you today. Thank you, Roba and Katina, for inviting me to share uh, some of my uh, work with you today. So I'm going to be talking for a few minutes about compassionate design. But before I go on to do that, I just wanted to get you to do some work yourselves. I'd like you to just imagine for a few minutes. I'd like you to imagine that you're in a place, sitting in a chair, and it's a place you don't know. And all around you, there are people that you don't recognize them. You can't remember exactly why you're here sitting in this chair. You can't actually remember who you are right now. Somebody has asked you your name and you can't actually remember your name. How do you think you might feel? How do you feel? You find that you can't speak and the words, when you try to say them, all come out wrongly. They, they're all jumbled up. How can you get the people to understand what you want? How do you feel? Are you feeling frustrated? Are you feeling anxious? Those are the feelings that people have when they're in the advanced stages of dementia because the result of uh, the symptoms that they're experiencing make them feel 
very anxious, very lost, very confused often. And who can speak for them? Who can help the world of design to understand what they want when they're not able to tell us? And I guess in a nutshell, that's what compassionate design is about. It's about trying to find ways that are sensitive, loving, caring, to design appropriately for people who don't have a voice and who aren't able to tell you exactly what they want. So I'm going to be talking about the work we've been doing with people living with advanced dementia. And there are some sketches here of a few of the people that we've worked with. And underneath them, some of the products, prototype products that we've developed. These are examples from the LAUGH project. LAUGH is an acronym and it stands for Ludic Artifacts Using Gesture and Haptics. So what does that mean? It's very simple, really. Playful objects that, use, that, that you use in your hands. When people are very anxious and agitated, having something to hold on to, having something to fiddle with and touch can be very soothing and meaningful sometimes and purposeful. Uh, so the Laugh Project, the aim of the Laugh Project was to enhance people's sense of well-being and to give them fun and pleasure. These are people who are often the most marginalized and forgotten in society, who will sit for many hours in a chair with nobody else there. And so giving them something that's relevant to them, highly personalized, and something that they can touch and hold can really benefit. Well, that's what we found through through doing the laugh research. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that and some of the things we've made. But one of the things that was particularly uh, significant that emerged from the laugh project was a product called Hug. And as you've heard in the in the introduction from Roba, Hug is a soft, comforting de device designed to be cuddled and designed to reduce that sense of anxiety that many people feel when they're in the later stages of dementia. So a hug has weighted arms and legs and it wraps around the body and gives uh, the feeling of being cuddled uh, just as you can cuddle it. So it's like a reciprocal hug. And inside hug, there's a beating heart and a little music player that can be programmed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we came to develop HUG. But underpinning everything that we've done really has been this idea of compassionate design. And compassionate design has been tested out, if you like, through the LAUGH and LAUGH Empowered projects. And it sort of emerged through a variety of projects that we uh, worked on prior to the LAUGH project involving people with advanced dementia and, and really trying to find what are the key things that, um, that we need to include when we're des designing for people who aren't able to tell us what they need. And at the heart of it is the person themselves and being able to see the person and not the disease being able to show loving kindness towards that individual through the design process. And we find that there are three things that, that seem to be particularly important when we're designing for people living with advanced dementia. So if your memory is impaired or if your perception of the world is changed, um, it's really important that you don't focus on memory or thinking about the future. It's really important to stay in the moment. And our senses do that all the time through our experience of the world. They're keeping us in touch with the world and they're keeping us in the now. And so making sure that designs consider the sensory properties of an object 
or a product or a service are really important for people living with advanced dementia. If you're in that situation, we imagined at the start where you don't even know who you are and you don't know what your name is or what your lived experience has been anymore because the disease has robbed you of that. It's really important to design in things that help you to retain your sense of personhood, because by doing that, you can retain a person's dignity and worth. That lived person, that lived life uh, of the person is still there. That person is still there. It's that those experiences are sedimented in their very body and being. And finding ways to bring that back and communicate it to the world, even when they can't communicate it, is vitally important. And technology is brilliant at enabling us to do that. And connection. Connection is so important because one of the things that happens as a person becomes, uh, uh, as a person moves into the later stage of the disease, is that they become more disconnected from the world around them, more withdrawn into themselves and un unable to connect with other people. So finding ways through the design process to connect with them, finding uh, ways that help them to connect to the world, around, the world around them and to the people around them is terribly important. So those were three things that were vital, but probably the, the most important thing of all is, is that compassionate process of, of, of seeing the person and, and showing loving kindness towards them. So what, what do I mean by compassion? What, what actually is compassion? Well, compassion is a sense of concern that arises when we feel, when we are confronted by another's suffering and we feel motivated to see that suffering relieved. Compassion is a doing word. It's all about wanting to make a difference, wanting to make a change for the better. And so compassionate design is really um, a design approach that aims to try and make the world a better place for people living with dementia, cognitive impairment, I'm sure other diseases as well, where, where people feel uh, they've lost their voice and they're unable to express what they want themselves. So dementia that we have been exploring through our work is a word that describes a set of symptoms that come as a result of various brain diseases. There are over a hundred different forms of dementia and Alzheimer's disease is probably the most commonly known of, of the uh, um, diseases. And, out, and um, dementia affects memory. Sometimes, not always. It affects thinking. It affects behavior. It affects perception. It affects communication. And obviously different dementias uh, will have um, different uh, implications for different people. Everybody is unique. Everybody's experience of dementia is unique. Because it's such a complicated condition with such a range of symptoms and implications on a person's daily life, um, keeping that individual focus, keeping the person at the center of it, of uh, the design process becomes absolutely fundamental. So I'm going to focus just for a few minutes on, on uh, sensory and do that through sharing a story and a project uh, that was undertaken quite a long time ago, actually, uh, before the LAUGH project. One of the earliest uh, projects that we worked on. This is Bill. And Bill was living with uh, Louis Body's dementia. And that's a particularly distressing form of dementia that includes uh, a tremor. Uh, and in, in the later stage that Bill was in, he was blind. 
he was bed bound, chair bound, um, he couldn't speak and his quality of life was quite limited. He was in a care home and um, he was visited daily by his adoring wife, Elaine, who was very sad that she and Bill could no longer share the wonderful nature walks that they used to do. And she really enjoyed uh, memories of walking with Bill in a place called Aberglasney Gardens in South Wales. And when we asked her what we might do to help Bill, what, we, what could we design? She said something that, that could inspire the, those times again for her. And so what we did was we developed a blanket, which you can see on Bill's lap here, which is inspired by Aberglasney Gardens and the walks that they used to go on. And it's based on the formal garden at Aberglasney, and it's full of textures and surfaces and uh, sensory triggers that will remind um, Elaine of walking with Bill in the garden and also to trigger those emotional memories which are retained through dementia for Bill. The, the, the noise of uh, the wildlife and running water. Um, that's a, a close up detail of uh, the section of the blanket that contains the electronics. You can see a little microphone there. It was really basic stuff, really simple, a little uh, bit of a, a microcontroller in there with some sound files on and little touch capacitive uh, touch um, buttons to operate it very simple and i've got a video here which i'm hoping will work to show you how it works So you had a little taste there of what it's like to, to walk in the Welsh countryside. The lovely thing about the blanket was that, um, that when Bill and Elaine had used it, they used it together. They held hands as they went for a walk at Bill's bedside. And Elaine said that it brought back intimacy into their relationship even though Bill was at a really advanced stage in his dementia, there was connection again, and there was a sense of togetherness. Bill was experiencing the sensory qualities of the textile, um, whereas for Elaine, she was remembering the intimate times they'd had together. So you can see compassionate design, it's highly personalized to them. It's highly sensory, the technology in, embedded in it is simply um, uh, emphasizing uh, some of the sensory properties through sound and it connected them so the three things are all there and help to underpin that design connection so important when somebody feels that they um, they're so alone in their dementia so in the care homes that we worked with, um, we were told in the three care homes that we worked very closely with, we were told that only half the people living in those homes ever got a visitor. Because people tend to think if somebody's forgotten them, if they, if, if they can't remember their name, if they, they stop recognizing them, but actually they don't need to visit them anymore because you know there's no benefit 
but actually there's huge benefit that person is still the person they've always been it's just they're not able to communicate and to remember but having somebody visit having somebody hold your hand or smile at you and be there with you is so important for somebody living with dementia so one of the things uh, that's really important is that being able to design in such a way that it encourages people to visit and encourages people to want to communicate. So we did a project called Dementia Aprons where we were making simple garments that were again highly sensory and personalized. So each of these aprons was made for, a, for an individual. And uh, the idea was these were on the body and therefore would remain with the person and not get dropped on the floor and forgotten about. And if you look at the yellow apron in the middle, you will see there's a little rag doll in, in the pocket on that apron. And the reason for that is it was made, oh, I've gone too fast. It was made for this lady, Vilma. And Vilma had been a mum, a grandma, and was now a great grandma. And her life had been filled with children and children were visiting her. And she's holding a little soft dog here, which we made again to go in the pocket along with the rag doll. This dog has a little microcontroller inside it. And it's uh, when you press the nose on the dog, it makes uh, doggy noises, but a specific dog. It was, uh, her favorite pet was a West Highland Terrier. So the noises on this um, soft dog are West Highland Terrier noises that she was familiar with. And here's Wilma with her daughter and with her great, great granddaughter. And you can see the happiness between the three of them and the connection that's going on, the eye contact between the great granddaughter and the great grandma and the, and the grandma. And yet that was a very sad day because it was the day, the first day that Vilma didn't know who her family was. She didn't recognize her daughter or her granddaughter or her great granddaughter that day. So it could have been a very sad day, but actually it was a very happy visit. Uh, and I was blessed to be there with my camera and took this photograph of them. It was happy because they had something to play with in the moment and to experience together, to talk about, to touch, to feel, to hold. And that love and that connection was still there. And it didn't matter that Vilma didn't recognize or know who they were. She, she knew emotionally that they were uh, loving, connected uh, people. So that idea of keeping things highly personalized, as I said, is, is vital. And this is an example here of something that we created during the LAUGH project. So this is a prototype of a, uh, a handheld steering wheel for a car, uh, an old fashioned car. <laughs> and it was designed for um, David, who was had been a roadside recovery driver, he worked for the AA, and uh, he had been a car mechanic, and his favourite uh, pastime was taking his caravan away for holidays and weekends away. So driving was really important to David. So this steering wheel uh, is freestanding; it can be held and when it's turned on, it vibrates just like the engine is running on the car. It's got uh, um, indicator lights that flash and uh, um, a tune in an old fashioned tune in radio. And that was uh, programmed with David's favorite music, which happened to be the killer, the killers and uh, Queen. So uh, it, it was a freestanding object that he could hold. And here he is holding it with his two carers uh, 
and taking them on a road trip to buy ice cream at the seaside. David was very, very poorly when this photograph was taken and really coming towards the end of his life and had been in bed most of the time. But he got up and they wheeled him in in his wheelchair and we gave him the steering wheel. And he had such a lot of fun and such a lot of pleasure with this. And you can see he's trying to talk. He, he wasn't speaking, but he did try and speak. And the care home manager said there was more interaction with David on this particular afternoon than they'd ever experienced with him in the whole time that he'd lived in the care home. So when you get it right, when you can work out what the thing is that the person uh, really wants or is right for them, um, it can bring such a lot of joy and pleasure. And you can see the connection, the connection between these three people through the object. So highly personalised, connecting and full of sensory stimulation. It's got vibration through the steering wheel as if the engine's running. It's got the lights flashing, the indicators, and it's got the tune in radio playing his favourite music. Oh, I think I've gone too fast again. So this is Hug, and this is Hug, the very first hug made for Thelma, this lady, on the very first time she ever experienced having Hug. Thelma was on end of life care. She was not thought to be likely to live more than a couple of weeks after um, this photograph was taken. She didn't open her eyes. You can see her hand is uh, clenched tight. Um, she was in bed most of the time. She was hardly eating. She wasn't able to speak. And we put hug on her on this day. Um, and she, you can see she's just nestling her head down, enjoying having a cuddle. And the reason we made Hug was because uh, her carer had said to us, you know, there's nothing really that you can make for Thelma. There's nothing she needs really. All she really needs is a hug. And so that's, that's what we tried to do. And inside Hug, as I said, there's a little simulated beating heart and a music player. And Thelma's favourite music was wartime songs, especially the songs of Vera Lynn. So what she's listening to in this photograph are songs being sung by Vera Lee. This is Anne, her carer, who said to us all she needs is a hug. And this is Thelma after a week of having had hug. We went back after a week and we went back after a month and we went back after three months to see how she was getting on. And the change was astounding. So after a week, you can see she's more awake, more alert. After a month, she was no longer spending most of the day in bed. She was up in a chair talking to the other residents. Yes, talking to the other residents. This was a lady who was no longer speaking and she started to speak again. Hug for her was a baby and it needed looking after and she suddenly had purpose to live. She started eating again and her general health improved. And although she was a lady that fell frequently, once she had hug, she never fell again, which was amazing. And although she wasn't thought likely to live very long at all, she actually lived for nine more months after this photograph was taken. The amazing thing also is that she wasn't just existing, she was enjoying life. The other residents in the care home were wanting to ask her about her baby. So she was connecting. There was something to talk about, there was something to do. So again, in terms of compassionate design, Hug is a very sensory object. It's soft and squishy and cuddly, it's weighted. It's got a heartbeat that vibrates, pulses, and it plays music.
and for some reason it's not working ah there we are so the welsh government gave us some research funding to find out whether or not it was just thelma that was going to benefit from hug or whether actually hug might be beneficial for other people as well so we had funding to carry out a trial in a care home with 20 residents and then in a hospital context again with 20 more 20 patients so this is the team at the care home on the day that we uh, trained them up in how to how to use hug and the lady on the front row jackie pool undertook the research the evaluation in the care home and this is what we found that 87 percent of the participants who used hug over six months showed an increase in well-being so it wasn't just thelma that benefited from hug other people seemed to respond well as well not everybody not everybody wants a hug not everybody responds to human hugs and over half of those who responded well to hug showed some increase in their cognitive and functional ability and that really was amazing um, dementia is a degenerative disease so even to maintain some cognitive and functional ability would have been a positive from the research but actually to have some people uh, have an increase in that really was astounding and just goes to show how sometimes people are are anxious afraid under stimulated and and just probably bored and depressed so hug really seemed to help in the care home context and this is this lady here with her hug. She was a musician and a singer, and she had Beatles music on her hug, which she called Jude. And you can see the joy in her face with her hug. So, um, yeah, it worked, seemed to work well in the care home. So we tried it in the hospital context uh, pretty much at the same time and just as the pandemic began so really tricky time to be working in a hospital in fact we weren't able to go in at all so we relied very heavily on the medical staff to do our evaluation for us but for the patients who received hugs they were received on prescription with a care plan uh, with hug and here is uh, the consultant um, dr ben jelly that we worked with at the hospital and uh, to the team there with the hugs and um, the findings from that study uh, came from a, a qualitative um, uh, set of qualitative interviews with nhs staff in the hospital and again we found although hug didn't work for everybody as you know inevitably it wasn't going to where it did work it really did work very well and for people who were anxious and afraid and agitated it definitely reduced their anxiety it helped with communication and connection it helped reduce loneliness and isolation gave people a sense of pur purpose it seemed to help people to want to eat and drink more as well and provided an alternative to prescribed medication for some people. So for some people, they were given a hug uh, when they were very anxious instead of medication. And that medication sometimes makes people very drowsy. And then sometimes they go on to have falls. And so uh, the medical staff said they felt it was reducing the falls risk. It enabled uh, things like blood pressure to be taken and for people to have uh, personal care wash, be, be washed and, and dressed without them feeling quite so distressed. And um, for those uh, patients who were particularly agitated and distressed and crying out or making a lot of disturbance, they calmed down and so um, 
the staff found HUG really helpful to have on the ward. For some patients who had uh, suffered a stroke, um, there is a feeling that uh, that, that they're um, falling. They, they have a sense of falling. Uh, but hug when they had hug on them, they felt grounded and, and lost that um, that that sense of, of falling that makes people feel very anxious. So, as a result of uh, the work we were doing and seeing the positives, it, it seemed really important that we should get hug out to as many people as we could, and to do that, it meant manufacturing hug and. Uh, setting up a business, which we did with the help of Alzheimer's Society, who uh, made us their accelerator partner, one of, one of three accelerator partners during the last year through 2021. Our business is called Hug by Laugh, and uh, we're really grateful to Alzheimer's Society for helping us to get started. Hug is for sale through the Alzheimer's Society online store in the UK and through our website. Um, again, I've missed a slide for some reason. This is our website. Um, so there are stories on there from testimonials from people who have used HUG or whose loved ones have used HUG. Um, and uh, it's a place where you can purchase a hug. And this is Pauline with her hug. And I've got a little two minute film that I'm going to show you uh, when I finish speaking now that just gives um, more of an idea of, uh, of the detail about hug. But just to finish up, I'd like to come back to compassionate design. So there is a book that I wrote at, at the end of the LAUGH project that's available as a free download, a free PDF, and it has the work that we did as a team from the, from the LAUGH project, um, telling some of the stories and explaining how compassionate design underpinned the work that we did. Um, so if, if you want a copy, uh, you can go to the laughproject.info website or you can get it from the Cardiff Metropolitan University Research Repository um, through the library there. So if you just Google it, it, it should come up. So I, I hope that um, you found that interesting and that you can see how placing that person and loving kindness for that person is probably the most important thing we can do as designers in order to design a better world. And the three things, uh, sensory stimulation, personalization and connection are so important uh, when designing for people who are cognitively impaired or who have advanced dementia. And actually, probably those are things that that will resonate with designers um, for other groups of people and other illnesses or diseases as well. So I'm going to just show my final slide um, to acknowledge our funders and the people that we have worked with. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I'm going to show the short hug film. What is nice about a hug? It sort of presses bits of you against bits of the other person and when you see somebody you love you go oh, oh that's lovely. With those words, Pauline Jenkins describes the thinking behind a research project at Cardiff Metropolitan University to reduce anxiety in people living with dementia with a hug. It's soft, just the right weight in all the right places. It feels just like a hug. In fact, it is a hug. 
It works best when it's introduced in a caring way. It's got a heartbeat and plays music. It's easy to add your own playlist of favourites. What does she make you feel like? Cozy. Cozy? It goes in the washing machine quite happily. It's quite literally wrap around care for those times when we need it most. Here we are. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, good morning, good evening. I am Jason Miller. I am a PhD student at Arizona State University in the Human Systems Engineering Department. Uh, Dr. Treadaway, thank you so much for your presentation this morning. I I remember I sent you a note saying, I'm so excited to be here. You told me that I've already heard it, except I believe I can listen to it multiple times and get new information each time that I hear it. Uh, I was part of a Smart Cities class for Arizona State with Dr. Katina Michael, and we were researching dementia. I did a search for dementia, and then I did a search for dementia and haptics, and I found you, or I found a professor that was working with you and requested an interview in it. And it took a while to get to you, except it was, it was life-changing for me. Uh, I didn't know at the time that I thought originally it was just a project, like I had to do an interview, I wanted a grade. But what I walked away with was uh, placing the person at the center of the design. It changed the narrative for me. Like it's not, it's not my story that dictates who I am. I'm still at the center of my designs, uh, wanting to help people, and that my story plays an impact and that it can help others. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for changing my life. And I look forward to many, many moments with you because I know that my research, although it's not focused on dementia, I'm looking at uh, creating a haptic device for those facing recidivism who were formerly incarcerated the connection and the personalization uh, of compassionate design has changed my eyes to more ways to look at the world and look at my research. So thank you very much. Uh, I will be moderating today. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of questions that came through chat. Uh, one, there's two from Dr. Jason Sargent. Uh, the first one is, Kathy, how do you personally cope with working in such a heavy emotive and personal impact research environment? Mm. I have a very good team and uh, we have been very supportive of each other. So I think that's that's one thing. It is very challenging, but it's also, as Jason just said, it's so rewarding. It's rewarding to see people benefit from what you're doing. And these people are often so forgotten. They don't, many of them don't get visitors. and. I mean, I showed two examples of people who have lovely visitors, families who are there for them, but we saw so many people who never got a visitor and just going into the care homes and just being there seemed to be encouraging for some of the people, you know, just to hold somebody's hand and probably nobody else had held their hand. And one of the things I found so distressing really about the pandemic is that I haven't been able to do and continue that work um, because we haven't been allowed to go into care homes and hospitals. Um, and, you know, so I think that we are in a slightly different world now, but perhaps all the more reason uh, to talk about compassionate design and to share it really with other people so that people can be mind mindful of that, even if they can't have that experience of working directly with people. Thank you. One thing I forgot to ask, is that Adrian behind you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so during the interview, Dr. Treadaway was talking about hug. And one of the questions which is going to lead up to this is we asked if you ever named the hugs. And I'll let her talk about Adrian. Yeah. 
I, I didn't name this hug. Uh, this hug was named for me by somebody, somebody else. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it's Adrian really, but uh, I'd forgotten that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the thing about hug is, um, it can be what you want it to be. You know, it can be a companion. It can be a friend. It can be a baby. Uh, it can just be something like a cushion. I mean, people, I don't know if you've ever done this, but sit and hug a cushion while you watch TV or whatever. It can just be something as simple as that, or it can be more meaningful. It's such a simple idea. I can't think why nobody has done it before, but anyway. <laughs> and it leads me to another question from Dr. Sargent. It says, Kathy, are there other skin tones of hug for use in other cultures? Yes, we always get asked that question. It was a research project and we wanted to keep everything exactly the same. We were working in care homes in South Wales where uh, there weren't particularly diverse populations, ethnic, there wasn't ethnic diversity there. Um, so we needed to keep everything the same so there was no gender bias or colour preference bias. Um, so we kept them all the one color as neutral as we could make it okay so that can be contentious in itself um we made them all the same when we got as to set up the business and to start manufacturing um the cost of i mean this has been you know a whole new field for me going into manufacturing it's just a whole different world but the costs involved in, in, in making a, the first batch of a, of a product and taking it to market is so huge that we had to start somewhere. So we started with what we tested and tried. And yes, going forward, we would love to make them in other colours. Uh, people living with dementia actually like really bright colours because often the vision uh, is affected by dementia. And older people often have visual impairment anyway. So brighter, stronger colors would be good. Um, skin tones, yes, ethnic diversity, of course, that would make total sense. It's just money really at the moment, <laughs> but we plan to do that. We have a question from Martin. Thank you. Uh... Professor uh, way and Jason for giving me the, uh, the possibility to ask. Uh, Professor uh, Tadaway, your project is really inspiring. Uh, I'm really touched for all your work. Uh, and I wanted to ask a little more, you, you mentioned about the research project, but I think you show us a lot of the results and the importance and the values behind. And, and I think working with people with dementia and with Alzheimer's is like really, difficult what kind of like institutional um considerations you should have to when you do this research project too because also should we think about partnership hold your colleagues of the university to this how in particular how you what, what kind of data explore you know to, to make this compassionate design and and and, and show how this work to the world in addition to the important effects that you share towards your history and, and wonderful experience. Thank you, Marty. I, I was aware of the fact that I focused very strongly on just the one thing and I didn't explain about how we did the research. I didn't explain about how we get the personal information about people's life choices and preferences either. There just wasn't time. There's so much to tell. Um, it's a, a process. Each project is obviously different and quite a few of them have been written up and published. So if you go on our laughproject.info website, you will see there are quite a lot of papers there free to download uh, that tell the story of different projects and how we actually undertook the research. We involve a lot of people. So in the LAV project, we involved 170 different people, 70 different organizations, and we were in partnership with one care home provider and we worked with four different care homes within their umbrella group. Um, we worked with 15 
was it 15? I think it was originally 15 different families uh, and 10 people living with advanced dementia uh, quite closely. We did participatory workshops, some of them creative and fun things uh, where we got people to play and make things as part of our creative journey into how to develop playful things. We wanted to understand how people play and what, what, what does play mean for somebody living with dementia or somebody who's sensory impaired. Um, so yeah, there's such a lot to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> where to start <laughs> but like, i suggest you have a look at some of the papers if you're interested yeah, yeah i appreciate it. this like overview yeah. and like thank you very much and do download the pdf of the book the compassionate design book because there's bits in that that tell you how we did it as well thank you martin uh joseph you're next uh dr treadwell thank you very much for calling this to my attention um and, uh, and, it, and it sort of uh, seems to me that um, we focus a lot on high tech and engineering, uh, but that there's another side of engineering as well. Engineering is a social enterprise. Uh, at the end of the day, it's to help people. Um, and it seems to me that there might be opportunities to actually create a course for engineers to study things like this. This is not high tech. All right, but there are there are very serious and complex, perhaps, things that engineers should know. All right, and frankly, might want to explore because there are probably all kinds of opportunities uh, for them uh, in this field. So I just make that point for you know, consideration. <clears throat> Thank you, Joseph. As a first year PhD student, I totally agree with you. I think sometimes as a as an engineer, and also in the smart cities, we want to throw technology to everything. Like, oh, technology is going to resolve all of our problems. Except it comes down to something like hug that just makes you feel better. And even though the box is technical, and even though there's other devices that uh, Dr. Trudaway and her team has created, they're not going out and you know having to put all this new technology in to make something that, that makes a person feel better. I love Luma. I look at it all the time. Uh, <laughs> well, I think I contact. I think contact. You know, with with humans uh, is really at at that level. You know, we tend to think that Zoom is the manner in which we're you know intimately contacting other people. But frankly, you know, when we think about it. And I look around my room here. I'm in in my library. Um, you know, we have I have some acoustic instruments. I have a guitar. I have a banjo. I have a harmonica. Uh, these are very, rather simple devices, but they have such um, uh, impact, you know, on our emotions, you know, and how we think about things. And these are engineered devices, but they're simple devices. And it, but when I say simple. Uh, it, it, there's a lot that goes into its consideration. For instance, if you're going to make a guitar, you have to know what you're doing, and it's more complicated than one might imagine. And perhaps the same thing here, because as Dr. Treadwell was talking about, there may be uh, colors, for instance, or size or texture that all have a bearing, okay, on whether these things are effective. And so it, it, it ceases to be just a simple problem. Obviously, Dr. Treadwell has thought about this, and her people have, and they've come up with some products here that are probably more optimized than they might have been day one. Uh, so anyway, just, just another point. I think another thing about technology is that um, people can be quite resistant to technology. Mm -hmm. And where we have in, involved uh, microcontrollers and electronics, we've tried to make them invisible. They need to be as simple as possible to operate. They can be as complicated as anything inside. Mm -hmm. But for the person, not just the person using it, but the, the carer, the family member, they don't want to know. They don't want to know that they've got to create an MP3 file or what, whatever it is. 
they just want to be able to hug it and it works or switch it on and it goes and i think most people are like that i think you have your technophiles that love love technology love things with flashing lights or things that beep and flash and whatever and then you have your people that that really don't want any of that thank you very much <laughs> and in the busy world of a care home or a hospital the last thing carers need and, and nurses need are things that are complicated to set up or difficult to program or even that need batteries charging very often one of the big biggest problems we had hurt with hug in the hospital was that the nurses didn't have time to to recharge the batteries on the sound module uh, we've now made a sound module it now lasts for for a whole day at a time um, in fact longer than a day i believe um, but the ones, the prototype ones that went into the hospital only lasted four hours. And consequently, the patients didn't get the music and the heartbeat. So um, yeah, technology is great. It does, it can extend the sensory properties and it can help personalize an object. And that's wonderful, but it can also have its drawbacks. We also get people saying things like, oh well you could put sensors inside it and it could track somebody or it could you know monitor their whether or not they've um, had a drink or that those kind of things and um, i think there are also issues around ethics too with technology that need to be thought about but it's again that comes back to compassionate design it's having the it's having the loving kindness and the intention at the heart of what you're doing to get it right for the person. But that in itself is an engineering challenge. Mm. Uh, even what you have in your hands right now, what you're holding, they, um, is, is in and of itself thought through, right? And all of the things that make it what it is. And I don't think that's intuitive. I think you've got experience, you know, you've worked with these people. So it yeah, comes with yeah. some labor, right? And some thought. Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. If there are other questions and you don't want to remove your video, you can add them in the chat and I will ask them to Dr. Treadaway. I'll ask another question, Dr. Treadaway. I know a little bit about it because we've spoken and for all the participants, I'm, it was an hour interview and I wanted it to go, it could have gone two, three hours because the information was so fascinating, as well as just listening to your passion for the project. I was curious if you showed in the in the initial slide some of the portraits. Why do you yeah. do the portraits? Um, I feel that when I draw somebody, I get to know them because I've got to sit and look at them and Older people's faces are particularly lovely to draw anyway, because there's there's so much expression in their faces. Uh, we always do what we call a portrait, and that's a pen portrait of the person to collect their personal preferences, a little bit of an indication of their lived life, for instance, their occupation, uh, their family life, just enough to tell us you know, this person really loved animals or uh, this person worked in an office because those things can help spark ideas for, for a product that, that might be suitable for them. And I felt um, that I wanted to not just have that written information, but also to really keep that person at the heart um, of my th keep that person in my mind as I was thinking about what we would develop for them and by drawing them you have to you have to really look you have to spend time and while you're looking and drawing you're thinking about that person and their you know every line on a face is is a result of experience of life of being in the world and being connected with with the living world and other people you know laughter lines 
anxiety marks on a forehead. They're, they're all things that help you to understand what this person has lived just intuitively, just emotionally, not, not in any cognitive or analytical way. You just get a feel, oh, that lady, she's obviously full of fun. You can see it in her face. Or this guy is in pain. He's had some sadness or he's, he's hurting, you know. And so drawing, yeah, drawing for me is quite, it's quite an important thing, really, in collecting data. <laughs> you can call a drawing data. I would call a drawing data. <laughs> Thank you. What is next for Hug by Laugh? Um, what is next? Uh, at the moment, we are looking at how to develop um, the, the magic box, the module that goes inside. We're looking to increase the functionality of that so that we can work well, work with Bluetooth and things like that with it. So that will open up all sorts of other opportunities. Obviously, we need to look at uh, colour <laughs> and ethnicity and those sorts of things. Um, yeah, there's there's lots more to do. Uh, and as I said before, a lot of the limitations on what we can do is money, really. You know, you have to sell enough to make enough money to invest back in, in order to do new things. So um, that's where we are. We're a young startup company. The other thing is at the moment, we're only really able to sell in the UK, but we are currently exploring selling outside of the UK. Uh, and we're in discussion over, over that as well. So hopefully Hug will be available world, worldwide very soon, hopefully. That would be great. Thank you again for, for being here. I'm going to ask Dr. Michael to start, come in. And again, Dr. Treadaway, I, I can't thank you enough for not only being here, but for taking time uh, when it was for my class, after the class, and all the help that you have provided in my journey thus far. Thank you for your time. Very, very welcome, Jason, and good luck with everything. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you to Jason Miller for that wonderful moderation and reflection after Kathy's talk. Uh, we spent uh, the whole semester between September and December with uh, an amazing cohort of students from backgrounds in engineering, computer science, social sciences and beyond, uh, particularly as well our Thunderbird School of Management was uh, a strong cohort there uh, on the smart cities and as Jason noted, uh, the high fidelity solutions that people tout, like CCTV, um, biometrics, and so many other uh, smart city solutions, were things that we studied early on. Uh, but when it came time to conduct the interviews with various stakeholders in the Alzheimer's and dementia space, uh, we quickly realized low fidelity solutions were the answer, of which uh, Jason was able to find hug and find yourself, Kathy, and through an amazing uh, trail, uh, as one does, uh, we all uh, came back to realizing we were acquainted in some way through a project uh, that you were involved in with UTS in Australia and some of those staff members, those academics moving to the University of New South Wales, and of course, all the others uh, that are linked with you. It's always a small world, um, but uh, I know that if I had come across compassionate design, um, we would have used that toolkit as a means to explore the space of dementia. Uh, we re reviewed probably about 15 different toolkits, some of them uh, geared towards the unhoused, uh, doing co-design with the unhoused, uh, doing co-design with those living with disability, looked at co-design for indigenous people. Uh, and always towards the empowerment of the person. So that co-design was central to uh, our inquiry, but compassionate design puts love at the center. And Kathy, that term is often not addressed. And you mentioned ethics in the context of love. I remember speaking to somebody while I was walking the beach uh, sometime in July, August last year and saying, you know what we need? We need love ethics. And there was a giggle on the other side. You know, what do you mean you need love ethics? Well, in fact, plainly, you need love. 
um, we remove these virtues or these action words. As you said, compassion is an action word. To be compassionate is a doing word. You're in the act of something. But here, love is at the center. How simple, how crazy, how awesome, how wonderful. As engineers, as technologists, as people engaged in the development of a new innovation, to think about love at the center of a design process? How come we are not teaching like this? How come we forget the most important value in the whole world, which makes the world go round? Why aren't we receiving hugs more often in the right way? Uh, why aren't we looking towards simplicity and what is termed in the literature, calm technology? You, you call that invisible electronics, and it is, and it's calm. And just in your voice, Kathy, you imbue the calmness. I never feel rushed talking to you. I never feel like you have something else to do. I probably think that you are looking at the lines on my face. <laughs> and we are studying each other in the right way and observing that we're human and we have a heartbeat and we care and we want to be cared for and there's empathy. But how come the world doesn't talk about these things? What's your reflection on why the most obvious virtue is not at the heart of every process in society? Why is that? Well, that's a big, big question, isn't it? I, I would like to acknowledge here the work of uh, the work of uh, Barbara Fredrickson, um, Professor Barbara Fredrickson, who wrote the, the book Love 2.0. And she talks about moments of connection being moments of love. And that we, when we connect with each other as human beings and we look into each other's eyes, that something changes in our brains. <laughs> and that thing that changes is love. And um, when I read that book, that was so, I found that so inspiring. And I think that's, that's been uh, very much an, ins you know, an inspiration to the, to the work that I've done. Um, but yeah, um, I think people think it's a bit soppy, don't they? Love is a bit of a, why would you, you know, why would you want to talk about love? But when you see somebody living their last few weeks of life, when you see somebody on end of life care, when you see somebody in a wheelchair who can hardly move and who can't, can't speak, who can't see, what can you do? What can you give them? There's only one thing you can give them and that's love, you know? Um, it's like when you see a small baby, you know, that it's the same thing, they're helpless. They need you, they need that connection to be part of humanity, to, to still be valued and cared about and so I suppose that's that's what's behind it isn't it you know it's it's not a, a wishy-washy sentimental romantic um love it's love that cares it's love that wants to make a difference and love that wants to keep us human beings connected with each other because together we can make a much better world that's beautiful, especially the um, connection there with Love 2.0 and what drives your research agenda. You know, Kathy, you'd be very well aware of all the different co-design and by-design approaches. We talk about privacy by design. We talk about democracy by design, care by design for robotics. The list goes on and on by design. Something that strikes me here is that you don't talk about compassion by design. Mm. It's just plainly compassionate design. It is implicit in a design process. It's not a by design anything. It's not a value sensitive design or values by design. Or It is it. It is encapsulated. Did you investigate other types of design approaches before you came up with this compassionate design toolkit? Yeah, so I mean, we obviously we had looked at other ways of working and, um, and participatory approaches, co-design approaches. Um, yeah, definitely. And I'd, I'd got very interested in Peter de Smet's work on positive design. And uh, when we started out, um, I guess his work was very much at the forefront of my mind. But 
it just didn't work for it didn't work for dementia you know um virtue and i'm trying to think of the other things it just didn't quite fit it because it re required cognition it required somebody to be mindful of, of, of the, um, how they were responding to the design and it just didn't i just didn't feel it it quite worked and and so compassionate design very heavily borrows from both and i say this in the book from the work of barbara fredericks and, and positive psychology and posit and peter de smet and a polmeyer in the netherlands and positive design um, and it it tries to bring some of the thinking behind those two approaches together well fredrickson's work is, is around um well she's a positive psychologist so it's about trying to make a better world uh, by um, looking at looking at the positives and positives in well-being um, and so that that's where compassionate design really evolved i suppose from that and from actually just working with pe with people <laughs> yeah thank you for that background um i'm inspired to think of listening to you, the notion of design justice and that word personalized uh, in the design justice literature, uh, it's not really about building for the mass market. It's taking care of the kind of innovation you develop and design um, to allow that personalization. If you look at designing assistive technologies for those who need it, um, there is a fair amount of personalization that happens for building for those uh, living with disability, for example. Um, but it strikes me that despite the simplicity of hug, that in the transference of the connection of how to adopt hug into one's life, uh, whether it's at end of life or whether we begin to use hug for children, we keep uh, bombarding our children with technology mm -hmm. and uh, hug is a return to those early kinds of toys in inverted commas mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. simple like the rag dolls uh, that were used in role play and there was a connection between two kids or but between the child and the toy uh, in a, a role play or in a development of some sort um, and what strikes me is that despite there's a piece of electronics in HUG, it is not Wi-Fi enabled. The pressure must be on to make it Wi-Fi enabled, to almost place a mobile phone within HUG. It's probably cheaper to do that. It probably has a longer lasting battery. But the fact that you've resisted from going that way, it tells me something about the purity of the artifact and its connection. There are also issues around hospitals and, and uh, working with Wi-Fi and uh, same with care homes, actually. Um, not everywhere is as uh, high tech as you think it might be. Uh, and then in hospital, obviously, that you can get interference with machines and devices. So yeah, it can be it can be problematic. It's not quite so straightforward. And we, we have had to amend things and make things to work in the context for which they've uh, gone into. Um, and there's loads of room for improvement and changes, as I said, going forward. We're, we're at a quite an early stage. But um, and, and as you said, it, it is a simple thing. And even without even without this, the magic box inside that gives the heartbeat and the music um, in hospital, the patient still benefited just from having the weighted sensory soft cuddly thing. Um, so, you know, do we need the technology at all? I, I think they they felt, I think there was a feeling that the heartbeat was really soothing for people. Um, and the doctor that we worked with um, commented on that as well. Uh, so yeah, sometimes technology is a blessing, but does it need to be all bells and whistles, maybe not, and maybe the simpler the better, and the most discreet way that you can embed it into something, the better. The other thing that worries me a little bit going forward and thinking about future stuff is sustainability. 
and the planet and you know um the textiles we were making that had bits of electronics in and that was stitched with conductive thread and which is all fine until you want to until it gets to the product end of life and then what happens then so i think that end of product life process needs to be thought about very carefully and we are doing that with hug um aiden taylor is our technical director and he is working very closely with um the whole um uh, what's the word i forgot what the word is now you know the circular um economy and mm -hmm. making sure things can be recycled and reused so we're very mindful of that and uh in terms of materials as well, you know, going forward, that would be an aspiration that that hug mustn't uh, help destroy the planet. You know, it's it's got to be something that that's um, bringing love to the world as well. <laughs> um, but so these are aspirations going forward that we haven't achieved yet, but hopefully we can. I would love to see hug remain without a Wi-Fi connection. And uh, I think it would be fantastic. Um, I want to inspire others to think about innovation in this way. Kathy, can you remember the moment or the, the period of time and what led to it that motivated you to conceive of the invention, Hug? Well, we, we had done quite a lot of workshops with experts so some of those experts were living with dementia at an earlier stage and some of them were carers and care home managers and health professionals and we'd got so that we understood uh, we were trying to find out about the key things the key themes that were likely to be applicable to um, more than one person so although we wanted to personalize things we wanted to look at the broad human things that were likely to be needed and one of those themes was nurturing and that came up in one of our workshops that people need to nurture things and things need to nurture us or people need to nurture us so it might be for instance gardening where you nurture a plant and, and keep it going and there have been studies in care homes to show that um uh, that pay, the residents that, that look after a plant, a house plant, actually live longer than those that don't. You know, we, we seem to need to nurture things as part of being human, but we also need to be nurtured ourselves. And so the, the theme that, that Hug sits within, and this is in the book, in the Compassionate Design book, a bit more explanation about this. Hug sits within the nurturing theme. So we had an idea that we needed to make something that, that worked within that theme. And we met Thelma and her carer and her carer inspired us by saying all that Thelma needed was a hug. Uh, and we had um, uh, another workshop where we explored the idea of, um, of that in a bit more detail with, with other people. But ultimately it was down to the design team, which is myself, Aidan, Taylor, and Dr. Jack Fennell, who leads Hug by Laugh Business, um, to, to come up with the final, the actual uh, prototype designs. Um, and uh, Hug was born in my sewing studio. <laughs> and I guess it was born out of a memory I had as, as a small child, probably three or four, sitting on my mum's lap in front of a roaring coal fire on a cold British winter's day, looking at the flames and the fire with my head against her breast and hearing her heart beat and feeling so content and loved and warm and safe and nurtured and so that I guess it, hug was me that's how I was and I was feeling my mum's heartbeat and so the idea of putting a heartbeat in seemed to be important um so yeah that's how that was the moment I guess of inspiration uh, behind hug <laughs>
That's absolutely beautiful. Uh, Jason Miller has observed you've been holding hug uh, for some time and it's even comforting for us to watch you holding a hug. And we're, we're a bit jealous, actually. Hug is not in our arms too, but uh, we can fix that soon. Um, that is it, you know, that image that you're leaving us with, uh, that safety and security uh, is what we need even from children onwards in our lifespan and often it goes missing and it comes back and it goes missing again. Uh, but there's something about hug uh, and security. Uh, it's almost like that feeling in our mother's womb, perhaps, uh, of being completely surrounded by safety. Um, I think you're right. I think it's an innate human uh, need, that, yes. that feeling of to be nurtured and, and to nurture. Um, having said that, I think that there are people who have yeah. life experiences that stop that and they don't want to be touched or hugged. And, you know, that's that's fine that that, you know, everybody is unique. Um, it doesn't work for everybody. Yes. In fact, uh, Jason, we remember we had a long discussion about that in class. I think Jason led that discussion. Uh, and it was very important for us to acknowledge that um, sometimes distance was required, other times proximity, and other times it would oscillate even during a given hour or day. Um, but what's been interesting during the, the pandemic, um, certainly in the UK, is the, the, the huge desire that's been expressed in the media um, amongst people wanting hug, wanting to have that human connection because they've been denied it so it's something that's really come to the fore I think people are much more aware of uh, human connection now they can't have it or it's not quite as freely available certainly not in the UK at the moment anyway I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world but um, you know we're only just feeling that we're coming out of this thing at the moment we um acknowledge that Kathy we acknowledge your amazing creativity it is one of the only artifacts I've actually looked at even from afar that is not discriminatory against faith creed ideology philosophy a place and any of the other kinds of uh, context you want to put a, an artifact in it is so ready for us to embrace so with that, I just want to say on behalf of ASU and the Society Policy Engineering Collective uh, of Dr. Robert Abbas and Mr. Jason Miller, thank you so much and the audience at large who will view this both today and in the coming years. Thank you for your life's work and thank you for actually coming and sharing what has motivated you to create HUG uh, with your company, Love. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>